In 122 AD, a great wall was erected across northern Britain. To Emperor Hadrian, there was no prestige in this wall, as this symbol of Roman might represented a simple dichotomy. South of this wall was a tamed people who had settled into a life of docile Roman servitude. North of this wall were an unconquered people who had never given up their tribal ways. In this fourth episode on the history of the ancient Celts, we will explore the lives of the Gauls under Roman rule and tell the tale of the Romans in Britain, the final Celtic frontier. While the Celts are preparing for the attack on the Wall of Hadrian, allow us to thank Hero Wars for sponsoring this video. Hero Wars is a cool online action RPG game with many PvP modes, which also has more than 130 campaign missions. Immerse yourself in the story, find the perfect combination of more than 50 heroes, make a team out of them, and use a big variety of unique skills to defeat the terrifying bosses. The game has six more modes, including Arena, Airship, Outland, Guild, Infinite Tower, and Grand Arena. Each of the modes has its own special advantages, some where you can summon powerful titans and explore dungeons, some where you can download artifacts for your battles and get cool rewards by fighting dangerous enemies and earning gold. You can also become a member of a guild to conquer your enemies with your new friends. Because there are new friends to be had, as more than 100 million players have already played Hero Wars and it has a huge community. Hero Wars is available both on mobile phones and through browsers, so you can play anywhere. Become a hero of the Hero Wars and collect your team of unique characters. Go into the game right now, kill the Archdemon, and get a super chest with a secret hero. And it's totally free. Scan this QR code or download the game from the link below. See you in the game. By 50 BC, Celtic continental Europe had been brought under the Roman Eagle through no small cost of blood. But this was not the end of their story. The native Celtic population still vastly outnumbered the colonial Latin presence, and their still functioning infrastructure was co-opted into the new Roman system. Major Gallic hillfort sites like Condatum, Lutetia, Lugdunum, Mediolanum, Serdica, and Ancyra were all turned into Roman towns, as clusters of wattle and daub houses were replaced with gridded streets, public baths, and gymnasiums. Despite the new management, these cities still served as the power center of a local Gallic tribe, much like the old hill forts. Outside of the cities, life did not initially change much for the Celts. The majority of them had been rural farmers, and under Roman rule, they lived in the same tribal villages as their ancestors, speaking the same Celtic languages and cultivating the same crops. To the Arvernian Cooper or Amorican Shepherd, it must have made little difference whether they paid a portion of their labours to a torque-wearing chieftain or to a toga-clad governor. As a result, the majority of the Gallic population would not fully Latinize for centuries. This assimilation did occur relatively faster among the higher castes, as the Romans focused on controlling their subject peoples from the top down. Many Celtic chieftains had been regularly interacting with Rome for centuries, and had already developed a substantially Romanized material culture. And this process sped up as many Gallic rulers sent their children off to receive a Roman education. The army served as another vehicle of assimilation, as Gauls who had been part of the aristocratic warrior caste signed up for the legion as auxiliaries, which served as an acceptable substitute to the proud Celtic warrior tradition. They learned Latin, and provided offerings to the imperial cult shrines present at every castra fort. Upon their retirement, they earned full Roman citizenship, cementing their integrated role in imperial society. Apart from the mandatory observance of the aforementioned imperial cult, which held the Roman emperors as divine beings to be revered, subject peoples were otherwise free to worship whatever deities they wished resulting in Celtic polytheism surviving well into the imperial era. Romans and Celts drew parallels between their gods. The thunder god Taranis was associated with the Roman Jupiter, while the warlike tribal protector Tutatis was likened to Mars. Some Celtic deities even became adopted by the Roman population, such as the horse goddess Epona, who became the patron of equestrians across the empire. 
however, there were limits to this cohabitation. The Druids, for example, were often the target of Roman persecution. Their suppression began under the reign of Emperor Tiberius and intensified under Emperor Claudius. Anti-Druidic policies were usually enacted under the pretext of ending ritual human sacrifice, but realistically, it was because the Druids threatened Roman control. Indeed, several Gallic rebellions were attributed to the seeds of discontent that Druids sowed from the shadows. Nevertheless, theirs was a clandestine order that proved hard to stamp out, and it is exceedingly likely that for generations, the Druids secretly continued their teachings in hidden caves and secret forest clearings. During the reign of Claudius, select Gallic aristocrats were granted the privilege of joining the Roman Senate. Many snobbish senators protested this move fervently. How could the emperor allow barbarians to sit among their hallowed ranks? In response, Claudius reminded them, matter-of-factly, that they themselves were the descendants of Umbrans, Sabines, and Samnites, Italic tribes the Romans had conquered and assimilated centuries earlier. To him, the Gauls were just the latest in a long line of peoples to be integrated into the grand imperial project. A shy and frail boy who struggled with a limp and a speech impediment, Claudius had stumbled into the imperial purple through circumstance, but he was no fool and knew that in order to win the support of his soldiers, he needed to shake off his craven reputation and engage in a grand conquest like his dynastic ancestors. To that end, he chose the one land where the Celts had not yet been conquered. To the Romans of the first century AD, Britain was a land wreathed in the fog of mystery, full of long-haired savages with haunting blue tattoos that gave them the mean of vengeful spirits. This was not entirely the truth, for the Britons had never been isolated from the outside world. For centuries they had regularly traded and intermarried with their Celtic cousins on the continent, and Julius Caesar himself had dabbled in the whole invading Britain thing in 54 BC. It didn't accomplish much, but in the decades that followed, chieftains on the island's southeast edge had begun gravitating into the Roman sphere of influence. Despite this, the Britons' supernatural reputation remained, so when Claudius announced to his legions where they were going, they almost mutinied, unwilling to invade land they thought to be inhabited by cannibals, dark magics, and otherworldly monsters. Nevertheless, these fears were eventually quashed, and in 43 AD, the battle for the final Celtic frontier had begun. As many as 150,000 warriors came together to oppose the Roman landing, led by the brothers Togodumnus and Caratacus, chieftains of the Catevolani tribe. At the river Medway, they met their foe, four legions, commanded by Claudius's top general, Aulus Plautius. The Britons were defeated, and with initial resistance quashed, Claudius marched his army to the Catevolani capital of Camelodunum, which he rode into astride a mighty elephant in a display of imperial prestige. Par for the course in Celtic history, disunity hampered the British war effort. Some tribes with already Roman-leaning leaders, like the Achenni, submitted quickly and were allowed to retain limited independence as client kings under Roman rule. Even the resistance leader Caratacus himself was captured by Queen Cartimandua of the Brigantes, who handed him to the Romans in chains. However, resistance continued in the northwest, spearheaded by the Silures and Ordovices tribes, who used guerrilla hit-and-run tactics to stymie the imperial advance for over a decade. Still, the Roman war machine proved relentless, and by 60 AD, was encroaching upon the island of Insmon, one of the most important religious sites in Britain, and home to the island's Druidic order. Like their continental brothers, the Druids of Britain had been one of the primary driving forces of resistance against the Empire. When a Roman army, led by Gaius Suetonius Paulinus, arrived on the Sacred Isle, he came face to face with a line of chanting wizards clad in occult robes, standing behind wild priestesses wreathed in black, waving torches and screaming curses in the eerie Brythonic tongue. The extremely superstitious legionnaires 
stood paralyzed in utter terror at the magic of the Druids. But Paulinus screamed courage into his men, and the Romans rallied, slaughtering all before them, and burning every sacred grove on the island to the ground. The scouring of the holiest site in Britain was meant to crush the native spirit, and yet the resistance continued. Its torch passed on to an iconic warrior queen who needs no introduction. In the English-speaking world, Boudicca of the Akeni is perhaps the single most famous Celtic figure in history. Her ruthless attempt to drive the Romans into the sea was the closest her people ever came to preserving their independence. But she too was defeated after a catastrophic massacre at Watling Street, dealt upon them by the druid burner Paulinus himself. Sporadic warfare continued for another 20 years, but by 80 AD, Britain had been subdued. Or had it? Over centuries of imperial occupation, formerly Celtic territories like Hispania and Gallia Transalpina had all become core domains of the Roman Empire. Roads, aqueducts and grand cities increasingly connected these outlying territories to the Italian heartland. The Gallic language survived among the peasantry for a time, but the local nobles, subjected to centuries of Latin education, had become thoroughly Romanized in every meaningful way. Britain was different. As the empire's furthest frontier territory, the Brythonic Celts never embraced the Roman identity as much as their cousins on the continent had. Of course, some did. The southern and eastern edges saw substantial infrastructure spending that led to the development of Roman roads, villas, and cities like Londinium and Aboricum. The local elites here soon got with the program, embracing the Latin language as well as the trappings of Roman material culture. But this civilization existed on a gradient. If a man left the paved streets of Londinium and travelled north or west, the landscape would change. He would begin to see fewer castras and villas, and more wattle roundhouses in the environs of Iron Age hillforts. The regions of what is now most of northern England and Wales had been where anti-Roman resistance had been strongest, and though the natives here had no doubt been conquered, they never truly embraced the Roman way of life like their southeastern kinsmen had. It was here that classical Celtic staples like Latin artwork and the tribal lifestyle survived. For nearly the entirety of imperial rule, these regions had to be kept under strict military occupation. But for all their independent spirit, these were not the last free Celts. Since the Iron Age, the northern half of the island of Britain, corresponding to modern Scotland and the northern extremity of modern England, had been home to many tribes. But the most powerful of these were the Caledoni, who lived in the highlands of modern Scotland. Their name was a proto-Celtic portmanteau, meaning those with hard feet. In later centuries, the Romans called them Picti, Latin for painted ones. 3,000 years ago, the first ancestors of the Celtic peoples had emerged in the idyllic mountains of what is now Austria. 1,000 years later, and 1,300 miles away, Amidst torrential rivers and rolling plains on the edge of the world, lay the final frontier of Celtic independence. The Caledonians first clashed with the Roman world around 81 AD, during the offensive campaigns of the governor of Britain, Gnaeus Julius Agricola. Despite a characteristically fierce resistance led by their chieftain Calgacus, Agricola was able to make significant headways into the Caledonian territory only to be recalled to Rome by Emperor Domitian before his conquests could be completed. Over the ensuing decades, the Caledonians mounted numerous attacks on the northernmost outposts of the empire. This became infuriating enough that in 122 AD, Emperor Hadrian made the fateful decision to build his iconic border wall to fence them out. The Caledonians were not unconquerable, and Rome probably could have brought them to heel with enough time, effort, and blood. However, the far north of Britain was too far away from the imperial heartland to rule effectively. Claudius had been pushing it by conquering southern Britain, large parts of which, as we covered earlier, remained loosely controlled at best. 
In the case of the Picts, it was better to just build a giant wall to keep them out of the civilized world entirely. That is not to say that future emperors didn't try to conquer the north anyway. For centuries, the painted warriors beyond the wall were a thorn in the empire's side. As it turns out, Hadrian's wall only slowed them down rather than stopping them entirely. Raids remained a constant problem, and the Picts sometimes aided tribes south of the wall in their constant rebellions. During the reign of Antoninus Pius, the Romans responded to this by invading Pictish territory once more and erecting the Antonine Wall. But this was abandoned a decade later, and the Romans fell back to Hadrian's old frontier. In 210 AD, Emperor Septimius Severus tried his hand at taming the Picts, resulting in a brutal campaign in which his highland foes played a frustrating game of guerrilla warfare. Here, Roman writer Cassius Dio claims they inflicted 50,000 Roman deaths through attrition alone. Severus later died of illness in Aboricum, and his son Caracalla forged a peace with the natives, forcing the Romans to once more retreat to Hadrian's line. The Picts were not the only Celts of late antiquity to be free of Roman rule. It is now we take a brief detour to Ireland, home to a subculture of the Celts known as the Gaels. The Gaels have so far assumed a background role in our series, isolated as they were on their remote island, far away from the concerns of classical Greco-Roman writers. Generally speaking, the Romans showed little interest in the Gaelic homeland, which they called Hibernia. Although when Agricola was invading the Caledonians, he also made preparations to launch an invasion across the Irish Sea, but those probably never materialized. Like northern Britain, Ireland was too remote to be worth conquering. Being a land of wild forests, deadly bogs and belligerent warlike tribesmen, it wasn't exactly prime real estate anyway. With that said, the island was not entirely isolated from the ancient world. It was a common destination for Britonic tribes fleeing Roman rule, and the discovery of Roman artifacts in the area has led modern archaeologists to believe that regular trade probably occurred across the Irish Sea. The Gaels could also be quite pestiferous. One of their tribes, the Scotti, were basically sea pirates that regularly raided the western coast of Britain. And yet, despite some trade links and a sprinkle of maritime war crimes, the Irish Gaels would not take centre stage in the history of the Celts until after the departure of the Romans from Britain which is something we will get into in the next chapter of this series. Our story now shifts back to the east, as we set the stage for the final twilight of Gallic culture in continental Europe. From the 3rd century AD, a new faith had taken the empire by storm, whose practitioners worshipped a strange Levantine prophet that the Romans themselves had put to death 200 years earlier. The Christian faith spread rapidly through the provinces, first as a persecuted underground cult, and then through a remarkable turn of fortunes, the state religion of the empire. Imperial opinions towards old gods quickly soured, and by 392 AD, the devoutly Christian emperor Theodosius banned all pagan practices entirely. This was probably the death knell of whatever remained of traditional Celtic polytheism on the continent. The next century would see the end of the world that the Gallo-Romans had lived under for generations. After the conquest of the Celts, the Germanic peoples had become the principal barbarian enemy of Rome. For centuries, many of their tribes had traded, integrated, or more often warred with Romans along the frontier of the Rhine and Danube rivers, in many ways, the 400 CE was the Germanic century, as peoples like the Visigoths, Ostrogoths, Vandals and Franks took advantage of imperial decay to pour into Roman territory and carve out kingdoms for themselves, thereby bringing an end to the western half of the empire. As the Germanic invaders of Europe settled into their newly conquered lands, they found themselves living amongst the direct descendants of chieftains and druids men who had once called themselves the warriors of the Senones, in Subris, Boii and Averni. But these people had been forever changed. 
Indeed, by the time the Western Roman Empire collapsed, the Celts of continental Europe had been under Latin hegemony for over 400 years, and Gaulish culture had become little more than an echo. Its ancient cults had been replaced by a monotheistic god from the Levant, and its language had been slowly declining in favour of the dialects of vulgar Latin that would evolve into today's modern Romance languages. It is possible that the Gaulish language survived in some isolated mountain villages as late as the 6th century AD, but as late antiquity transitioned into the Middle Ages, the Celtic identity had all but faded away, and a hybrid Germanic-Latin custom would be the predominant culture upon which most of the kingdoms of early medieval Europe were formed. Yet, on some far-flung islands on the edge of Europe, the ancient culture of Europe's most enigmatic people survived. After the fall of Rome, Britain was the last bastion of the Celts in Europe, but as the empire retreated from Albion's shores, it left the land vastly different from how it found it. In the south and east, a caste of Christian, Romanized Britons clung to the memory of the emperors who had long abandoned them. In the north, the unconquered Picts and Gaels now stood poised to invade their acculturated cousins, eager to pick at riches left behind by the dead monster that was Rome. But as the last Celts of Europe geared up to fight one another, a new threat was emerging from the east. From the shores of the North Sea, hardened men were now nearing the coast of Britain, with the hammer of Thunno hung around their necks and a prayer to Woden on their lips. The British Battle Royale was about to begin. In our next and final episode on the ancient Celts, we'll cover the world of sub-Roman Britain and the invasions of the Germanic, Angle and Saxon peoples, so make sure you have subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see the next video in the series. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.